Welcome into the CHGO White Sox podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook. Download the app today and use code CHGO when you sign up. Welcome into Studio A of our CHGO offices here in the West Loop of Chicago. I'm Sean Anderson, the host of the CHGO White Sox podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. And alongside me is Herb Lawrence. Hello. Follow him on Twitter at Ecknerwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. We got a lot today. Some breaking news for you. Breaking at about 1 o'clock today. Bob Nightingale of USA Today reporting that Jose Abreu will become a Houston Astro. Reportedly, it will be around a $60 million deal for three years for Pito. So we'll discuss the fallout of Jose leaving. And we'll also be joined by Stephen Woods from uh, 97.3. Uh, I was going to say 97.1 FM, the drive. 97.3, the fan out in San Diego. They're the flagship for the Padres radio station. Uh, Stephen will join us and we'll talk a little bit about Mike Clevenger and who the man is that will be joining the Sox. But let's jump into Pito. Obviously, this is the big story. This is the headline. Jose Abreu, after nine seasons with the Chicago White Sox, is gone what are your immediate thoughts Herb? imagine if you will this guy is literally one of the best players in the history of your franchise a poverty franchise but of your franchise you at the end of this bad tumultuous year say you know what you're too old we're good we think maybe the juice is not worth the squeeze and keeping you and extending you for a different year, for a, a longer contract. We appreciate your time, Jose. See you later. Then the team that just won the World Series about a month ago was like, yes, Jesus, please give us that. We're replacing our older Cuban legend and Yuri Gurriel with a more in his prime Cuban legend who's won an MVP recently, two, three seasons ago. For market value, more than he got paid by the White Sox, which was about $18 million. He's getting paid $20 million av- annual average value. So one of the worst franchises in baseball says no. The best says yes. What does it say about our franchise that we root for? These days are the days that I wish, and I knew this day was coming. I went, I'm not dumb. I, we've had these conversations that Jose's not coming back to the White Sox, but I was still holding out hope that, you know, somebody in that office would say, you know what, sanity will prevail, we need this guy back, and we'll find a way to have him, Aloy, and Andrew Vaughn coexist on the 2023 White Sox. But today's a day where I want to have that 1.21 gigawatts, that flux capacitor, to go back and beat that 12-year-old's ass. Marty! Who may be a White Sox fan. (laughs) Marty! I definitely do. Now, that White Sox, that guy also made me a line I fan, so thank you, kid. You're, You're a great kid. Today, I don't want to beat you up for that, but for that White Sox thing, man, oh, man. Did a poll. People were like, I was like, hey, do you feel the White Sox are a well-run organization? 96% said no. (laughs) 96%. As somebody and multiple people put, you can't get Americans to agree on anything, and they agree on that. I don't know who who the hell the 4% were. 901 votes. Yeah. The 4% was like Rick Hahn's. Burners and his Han bots. I think Rick does a great job. He needs he needs yeses on this. But today is just a dumb day. Like I know there are people out there like twenty million is way too much for him. Huh? Huh? Real organizations spend only twenty million on a first baseman who's going to give you production every year. So I'm mad today because the Astros, out of all the teams, saw him and chose him the day after we went and got our free agent. So it looks like our free agent is just much worse, even though he's going to contribute to our team. So it's just a a bad day for White Sox. And if you're a White Sox fan and not mad about this, I don't know what you're doing. It is an infuriating day for this front office to just do what they always do, which is the wrong move. If they have an inclination to do something, they should do the opposite. Yeah, we got a super chat here from Stefan Bardo uh, saying, sucks to see Jose go, but you can't keep running out first baseman in the outfield. The culture is changing on the south side, and I'm afraid can't, fans can't accept it. I don't know if it's about the culture changing or the idea that Andrew Vaughn and Aloy Jimenez will be taking over, and I even gotten some of that pushback on Twitter, like me saying, I think uh, the this was in response to me saying, I've been picturing this tweet for months and seeing it made me sick about Jose Abreu signing with the Astros, and it's just, it finally became real. 
Like, I didn't realize that it was just going to become real all of a sudden. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of rumors about this. It just happened. Jose Abreu became an Astro. I wasn't really ready for it. And we've tried to prepare ourselves for the past, like, three months to get ready for it. And even though it's happening, it still feels weird. Even though I think it's the best choice for the franchise, it is still weird because of everything that you said. He is the face of the franchise. He's the 2020 MVP. The Dodgers just let the 2019 MVP go, and you know every team in the world wants him. And the Astros just went out and paid Jose Abreu $20 million a year to play for him. I mean, how many bad contracts do the Astros have, right? I mean, exactly. like, th this, is, this is not a bad signing in any way. If the White Sox signed Jose Abreu to $20 uh, million dollars a year, I'd be frustrated because I don't, I wouldn't see the plan, but still I would understand it because it's 79. He's going to have his r n number retired here, yada, yada, yada. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's just kind of surprising that all of a sudden it happened now. Like was Mike Clevenger, the domino that needed to fall to mm. get Jose Abreu out of Chicago? Because it really did seem so bang, bang Clevenger signs. And then Abreu has gone. I just, I wonder how this all happened and fell out because him going to the Astros is no surprise. Him leaving the White Sox is no surprise. Still weird. Yeah. And I uh, see HL says the right decision, not the right decision. The right decision was to keep him. And you guys, and I get it. You have to get in the reality of what the White Sox have told you. And they have tricked us this whole time. And they were like, we don't have the money. Our payroll is X. And so we adjust our thinking to thinking, okay, their payroll is X. So they don't have the money to pay Jose Abreu. Yes, the fuck they do. They have plenty of money. They decided not to pay Jose Abreu. And you say, who's out there, well, we're going to play Andrew Vaughn. We're going to play Eloy Jimenez. This is Rick Hahn's fault. He assembled a bunch of first base DH types. And now you kick out the one that had the most production, the best player offensively of that team for nothing you didn't get a damn thing for it if you think if you were thinking that hey we're not going to re-sign Jose Abreu at least at the trade deadline I would have been much happier you said get out of here Jose we're gonna get something back for you and I know you couldn't do that because we're in the contention then were we though but to get zero nothing back for Jose Abreu one of the best players only Frank Thomas, in my mind, is a better player in my time that I've been watching baseball for this White Sox team. Only Frank Thomas. It. And we just let him go. And the best team in baseball is like, yes, we want that. Your trash is our treasure. <laughs> well, Imagine that. And that, look at Astros fans. Go to, go to Twitter right now. Check your Twitter and type up Jose Abreu Astros. Watch Astros fans be like, man. We were one of the best teams. This hard-hitting some bitch is coming to our team, and only Aaron Judge and Jordan Alvarez hit the ball harder and had a better average than him. It's in the league, and they're excited. We're supposed to be, oh, no, not Canerco. Jose Abreu, better than Paul Canerco. Yes. We got uh, some super chats in here, and you're right. Abreu is better than, than Paul Canerco here. Uh, we got some super chats from Rusted. Uh, I've been with this team my entire life. I'm Herb's age. It's never changed under Reinsdorf. They take our money and laugh at us. We gave them blackout crowds, and they repaid us with slaps. And, hey, I, 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 I as, you know, I mean, I'm a fan. I think it's a little bit different for me compared to you guys just because we get paid, you know, to watch these games, to, to, to cover the team. Like, this is our everyday life in a little bit of a different way than, than a fan. Um but I totally get this. I mean, the first time since 2011, the guaranteed rate field attendance has surpassed $2 million. And how they quote unquote repay you is by letting the franchise leader walk out. He doesn't get a final game. He doesn't get a send off in Chicago. There's no real warning or there's no real reason why. Rick Hahn really doesn't address it. He just beats around the bush and he'll wait until probably spring training or what the winter meetings to, to, to address this. The winter meetings is next week. He'll so, probably announce the signing. Well, they'll announce the signing of Mike Clevenger. And in that same vein, the press will be there and they'll talk about Jose Abreu, which I think will take over that conversation. They'll say right. like two questions for Clevy and like 17 for Jose. So, so that's a funny thing. And Vernon says here too, and thank you guys for the super chats. Uh, at least we got Clevenger sarcasm. Mm -hmm. um, that's the thing is I was really excited about, to talk about Mike Clevenger. Around noon today, I was sitting in my car and there was the tweet that came out from Jim Bowden saying, sources say that Clevenger and the White Sox have signed for 12 million. So taking the reports that we heard from, I think it was Morosi yesterday, it was about 8.5 or around 8 million or a little bit higher than 8 million, uh, seeing that there's probably now a 4 million jump in Clevenger, I was trying to think like, 
hey, is this like Jock where the White Sox wanted him to be around like 8.5, but Jock wanted to be around 10.5, and then it didn't end up working out, and they go and get eaten. Is this like the Jock situation, but they didn't get off their target? They just went out and got their guy no matter the price. And then, you know, that's $4 million I'm talking about, and the difference between Jose Abreu and, and Mike Clevenger is $8 million. So then, you know, 4 plus 8, 12. So we're talking about a whole $12 million difference there. Like, you know, it, it's just... It, it, it's 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 so dull. Like, yes, you got Mike Clevenger to fit out the fourth spot in the roster, but the main story of this entire offseason is exactly what happens the next day, that Jose Abreu, the franchise, is gone. And Frank Thomas is the only guy that is better, I think, to ever put on a White Sox uniform. And he kind of had a similar ending in a way. You know, he won a World Series. He did go on top. He didn't have that huge uh, team success like Jose Abreu. They both had their personal success with MVPs, but Frank didn't play a ton in 2005. He wasn't a huge part of that 2005 team's success. And then 2006, he goes to the Astros, or the, the A's. Uh, which one's more anticlimactic or frustrating as a fan? Seeing Frank leave with Pauly in the wings, or seeing Jose leave with Abreu, or sorry, with uh, seeing Jose leave with uh, Andrew in the wings? Going the one frustrating Houston. one is this one right here, because in the 2005 series the year, Frank played a good chunk of games, I think 25 or something like that, and hit like 12 home runs. And then he was hurt for the rest of the year. So we saw what the team was going to look like post-Frank. Carl Ever was at DH for the most part, not great, decent enough for the White Sox. Paul Konerka was still in his prime doing good stuff. So we knew Frank was going to be leaving the team, and to have a World Series to be his last thing that he remembers as the White Sox, good. Start a, new, start a fresh thing out there in Oakland. And also, we got the classic stay out of White Sox business from Ken Williams when Frank Thomas was talking a little smack over there with, with the Oakland A's. That's, that's worth it for Frank to go over there. But for a legend like that to leave the team, you know, it's a little tougher. But it was easier because we knew it was going to happen. This is just ludicrous. Like, I know that we are supposed to get ourselves prepared for this through October while the White Sox got eliminated in the uh, regular season. And we kept on talking about it. And we're like, well, the numbers game looks like – the one that's going to be out is Jose Abreu. It didn't hit reality till today. Well, and the thing today, too, again, like hurts. when they signed Yasmani Grandal, Kenny Williams saying like it's a five to seven year window. And I think I understand your point and a lot of fans' frustrations where he was the oh, most hell. productive player. So how is that going to lead to a World Series? Crazy super chat from uh, our two guys here. Derek, uh, thank you very much for the $4.99 super chat, uh, saying him leaving was expected, but of all the teams for him to go to, the Astros are laughing at us even more than now. I honestly think the Padres would have been worse just because the Padres would have had Fernando Tatis, Jose Abreu, they would have had Manny Machado. I would have found the Padres to be worse. I want the Houston Astros, or I wanted the Houston Astros for Jose because I think he can win a World Series. And that's what I want for him. He deserves all this team credit. Frank Thomas was a fantastic, fantastic, singular player. Had every single number. But Jose Abreu, and I was going for it. Uh, we're, we're putting together the top five Jose Abreu moments. The thing that consistently stuck out to me with Jose Abreu was he was always doing it for the team. Since yeah. 2014, since he debuted, he has the most played appearances in all of MLB. He's the only player with 5,500. He's consistently posting. And he's a guy that is going to mean so much to that Astros team. And I think you just plug in a guy that's going to be there and be so consistent for them. Th that's World Series contender written all over it. It's a smart signing by the Astros. But I don't know if the White Sox are in that same position. So that's why it's difficult for me to be like, oh, they should have signed him. I mean, they are if they wanted to be in that same position, but they choose not to. I think all this stuff with the White Sox is self-induced. Their budget, self-induced. Like, they can go, if they really wanted to go at the levels that other teams wanted to go to, they can go there. Mm -hmm. It's not impossible for them to go there. Yes, they were in top seven last year, top uh, top seven uh, right. payroll. They can go over $200 million if they really wanted to, but they don't want to. Again, they just got the $2 million in yeah. attendance. There, there should be no reason. We got we got another huge Jack -so, yeah. Jack -so super chat. <laughs> Go ahead, Jackson. This kid's my guy. Um, right, could you make this a little bit bigger, Lawrence? Because my Sorry. eyes are old. Uh, imagine Yankee fans, when Judge leaves, sucks to see Jose go, but you can't keep running out first baseman in the outfield. Also, we need to sign Judge. I think we need to have a big splash. The rest of the offseason needs to be good, and Abreu was half of this team's production. Jackson, I'm going to be completely honest. You are consistently in this chat, dropping super chats, I think you can afford Aaron Judge more than Jerry Reinsdorf can afford Aaron Judge. 
I, I really think you're right. Aaron Judge would make this team so much different, so much better. It's just not going to happen. If they can't afford the $20 million for Jose Abreu, the guy that's been here for nine years, that's going to have a retired number, that is an MVP, rookie of the year, they're not going to go out and spend even $100 million on a player, let alone $300 million. And that's the thing with Judge. Um, I would love to see him in a White Sox uniform, but it's just it's not going to happen. We do have a very special guest joining us, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, more about Jose Abreu going to the Astros right after we talk to him. But we do want to let you know about Shady Rays. Herb, you're... Your guy's from San Diego, so he, he probably needs some sunglasses. Shady Rays never understood why sunglasses were so expensive, so they set out to change it. You don't have to break the bank for quality sunglasses this fall because our friends at Shady Rays have you covered. Shady Rays are premium polarized shades featuring world-class optical clarity, substantial durability, and styles cater to everyone and every lifestyle. The best part about Shady Rays, they have the most insane protection program in all of eyewear, lost and broken replacements. If you lose or break your shades on day one, they told us that they will send you a brand new pair, no questions asked asked if you drop them in the lake off a cliff anything they will replace them and over 200,000 people have given five-star reviews to Shady Rays they are designer quality they look good feel good and they are made extremely well and exclusively for our listeners Shady Rays is going to be running their deepest deal this season use code CHGO for 50% off two or more pairs at ShadyRays.com buy one get one free you can get two pieces Two pairs for as low as $54. Redeem only at ShadyRays.com, wherever, uh, where you can find all their newest and best shades. Again, ShadyRays.com. Use code CHGO for 50% off two or more pairs. And our next partner is GameTime. Herb's used them in Atlanta. We've used them in Chicago. GameTime is the hottest new ticketing site that makes it easier than ever to score the best deals on tickets to sports, concerts, and shows. If you ever dreamed of sitting in a seat you never thought you could, whether it be at the 50-yard line, courtside, on the glass at a hockey game, behind home plate, floor, floor seats at the concerts, It's possible with the Game Time app. The biggest last-minute price drops can be found on the seats you never thought you could buy. And this Sunday, you got Bears-Packers. Huge rivalry, historic rivalry. And we have the CHGO tailgate happening on December 4th. So if you want to come out to the tailgate at 830 on Roosevelt, Michigan, you can buy tickets at allchgo.com. And then if you want to go to the game, it's just a 15-minute walk. You can download the Game Time app. Over 15 million people have downloaded the Game Time app, and they've scored the best seats to all their favorite events. So if you love CHGO, then you'll love Game Time. And the best way to support us is by buying your tickets through the link in the the description. Let's go to our very special guest of 97.3 The Fan out in San Diego, the flagship of the San Diego Padres. We have Stephen Woods joining us. Herb, you know, uh, Stephen from your time in, in San Diego. In the I barrier. Mean, we didn't cross paths, but we worked at the same station. Uh, we worked at the Mighty 1090 together uh, at the different times. I was there in 2016. He was there like 2018, 2019 before it uh, wrapped up. Uh, ugh, I hated that time where I got to see uh, the Mighty 1090 in Rosarito the transmitter go out. But Stephen Woods is a good uh, uh, San Diego Padre fan. Good to have him on. Ben and Woods show, my guy Paul Rundle, Rindel doing the uh, executive producing. How you doing, Stephen? Man, I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? We're doing great. You can follow Stephen on Twitter, at the Stephen Woods, and that's S-T-E-V-E-N. And uh, he's on 6 a.m. Uh, to 10 a.m. Uh, on uh, 97.3 FM, The Fan. We're good. We're at Mike Clevenger joining the South Side, and we're trying to figure out what we're getting in Mike Clevenger. A lot of talk about maturity for Mike Clevenger. Last time we heard about him in Chicago, uh, he was out on the town with Zach Plezak, uh, you know, skipping some COVID regulations. So uh, since that fateful day in August, I think, of 2020, how has Mike Clevenger matured uh, in San Diego? You know, uh, you're going to be talking to an unabashed uh, Mike Clevenger fan, and I, I just loved him. And I know I have a different perspective, you know, being in the media um, because we've gotten to talk to him, you know, off mic. We've gotten to, to chat with him. Um, he was so kind to my, my young son, who is uh, almost five years old. My, my son's got long blonde hair. And so he's naturally, he's a, he's a young fireballer. He loves to pitch in the backyard. He loves baseball. And uh, he loves Clev. He loves everything about him. You know, Clev is one of those guys. And so my son found out we were interviewing Clev and he, he drew him a picture. And I gave it to Clev and was like, hey, look, you know, you got kids. I don't feel the need. You need to keep this at all. But my son wanted me to make sure you had it. And it was this fish that he drew Clev. And uh, Clev could not have been cooler. Put it in his locker. And then randomly, I'm at a playoff game. 
And I get this tweet, and it's from Clev, and he's like, hey, we're putting the victory fish to good use today. And tweeted out before the game, we got down four runs. We came back and won that game. So talk about a special moment as a dad. Uh, I was elated. You know, and, and the maturity stuff, um, yeah, I mean, he's still a young dude, you know. And, and I will tell you guys this, though. He is a worker. Like, he – I wanted it for him so badly uh, against the Phillies and, and we, you know, staked him to a four run lead. And, and he had then the outing that he has said, he said after the game, he said it was the worst day of my life. So um, I, I know him enough to know that the dude probably didn't sleep for a couple of days uh, after that. It was, it was, it was tough to watch as a, a fan of his and obviously tough if you're a Padre fan. What happened? Like I know he came to the Padres in 2020 with the trade and then pretty much immediately had his Tommy John surgery. What happened in 2022 to Clevenger? Because the numbers, if you like, I got beef loaf has uh, said, you take out the Dodgers games and the Rockies yeah. games pretty solid, but you can't take yeah. out those games because those are part of the schedule. What is the full scale of Clevenger season? Was it as disappointing as the numbers look to us in Chicago? You know, man, you, you, it's baseball, right? So, we everyone wants to talk about sample size and and this and that you know I, uh, flashes of the old Clevenger certainly appeared I think he threw pretty well against you guys late in the year uh, had a really really nice outing like back to vintage form and so we were all kind of feeling good going into the playoffs um, you know it just it's one of those deals where I remember when it went down I remember exactly where I was. And I was so excited that we were getting Clev, you know, uh, the, the COVID stuff notwithstanding. Um, you're like, all right, cool. Everybody makes mistakes and everybody just, you know, it's not a, it's not a felonious, uh, you know, he didn't commit a felony. He exercised poor judgment. Um, and, you know, he gets the trade here. And I remember just being elated. And it was also partly because of who we were getting rid of that I was excited about too. So we get Clev in here and, you know, obviously sky's the limit. And then he gets hurt, you know, and that's tough. But but I know a lot about, you know, his road back to the mound. And just the fact that he was able to, you know, toe the rubber after a couple of Tommy Johns was pretty uh, outstanding. And then to pitch even, you know, like those, like you said, the Rockies, you can't throw it out because it does count. But my God, like that, that place eats people alive. And then, of course, the Dodgers went in 111 games and their juggernaut regular season. Um, you know, they, they, they roughed up a lot of pitchers. So I did see some really nice flashes from Clev. Um, I think he was used the right way here. I think he was, I think, you know, we were pretty deep in starting pitching, uh, until we weren't like most teams, but I, I liked the dude, man. And I thought it was such a good fit when I, I read the news this morning, uh, him in Chicago with that stable of, of guys that, you know, I think. I think they're going to be trying to prove a lot of people wrong this year too. I mean, there's some guys that had some down years that are that are better pitchers than what they showed. Um, you know, Giolito being one of those guys. I mean, there's there's more in that tank for sure. And I think Clev, if he's your number five, you're feeling pretty good. Yeah, I mean, we're hoping that Cats can work something out of him. Uh, but I do wonder with the Padres. Why not bring Clevenger back? Because you look at the rotation right now, Darvish, Snell, Musgrove, Martinez, it seems like there's an open spot for their fifth starter. So why not bring there somebody is. why not bring somebody who's, you know, around thirty years old to fit in around the same age of the current rotation? I, I couldn't agree more. And and you know, like I said on the air this morning, it wouldn't have surprised me at all if they brought him back. Um, I also it was weird too, and and I don't mean this as disrespect to Clev. Um but I'm, I'm happy to see him get a, a fresh start, right? Like, I, I, he knows that division really well. Uh, he pitched well against that division this year. Uh, he's, he's a good dude, and I think he'll be a good fit there. But I'm not overly, like, bummed out he's not going to be in the rotation next year. I'm bummed out I don't get to interview him, certainly. I'm bummed out I don't get to say what's up to him before a game. You know, stuff like that. He really – the thing I loved about him, and it's real big in San Diego. And, Herb, you know this. You can't come to town here and not embrace it. It's not going to go well for you. It's just not. like. And I'm sure that's true of a lot of places, but I've never seen – I've lived in a lot of places. I lived in Chicago uh, and had the time of my life there. And you have to embrace that city. 
You know, you can't come into town and be like, oh, well, this is how we did it back in Boston or this is how we did it. No one cares. Embrace the city. And he did. My God, did he embrace San Diego. So kind of made him a um, a favorite of a lot of fans. But, you know, I expect him to do the same. I really do. I expect him to do the same on the south side. And, um, certainly a unique brand of, of baseball and a unique brand of fan uh, for sure. And I think he's going to fit right in, man. And especially with, with those dudes that you got already down there, I think you guys are going to love him from a, a personal standpoint. I mean, there's, he's such a fun interview. That's what I'll miss the most. Can the Padres do better at the five? Maybe, maybe we'll see. I, you know, our general manager, I've, I've learned now covering the team for almost five years. I put nothing past him, nothing. I wouldn't be surprised if Justin Verlander and DeGrom are in our rotation in six weeks. Honestly, like yeah, no, truly. Yeah. The things that I used to go, well, it just doesn't like we're looking at Xander Bogarts right now. We have seven shortstops on this team. So <laughs> we'll we'll figure it out. I mean, that's just kind of the AJ Preller way. So nothing really surprises me uh, at all. But I'm 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 happy for him. He's a guy I'm always gonna root for. He's so damn funny on the air. Oh my god, he told some of the best stories. Uh, ever, uh, you know, you get a baseball player on from time to time. They're like, yeah, I just want to help the team win. Yeah. I'm working hard to do whatever I can. Not Clev, man. Clev would let it fly. And it was, it was an interviewer's dream. Well, the Padres have uh six, seven shortstops. We have six, seven first baseman. That's why we had to let our best one go today. It was a little tough, but I see the guitars back there. I know you like via Twitter. So you, yeah. I know you like music. So I'm asking this for our third partner. Who's now in uh on his honeymoon in uh, Australia, but you're a guy, and Clevenger's a guy who loves the Grateful Dead. Do you guys ever talk about that on the air, about his music preferences and who he specifically likes? He uh, he really embraced a lot of the San Diego bands uh, when he was here, you know, and, and would go to Tribal Seed shows and stuff like that. And, and he was all over the place. I mean, Clev likes it all. I like it all, too. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty eclectic with my musical tastes, and uh, but that's one of the things I liked most about him. You'd see him you know, pitch a game and then he'd be out at a concert that night. Uh, he was always out and about around, uh, around San Diego and beachy guy. And, you know, it's funny though. Like you see the long hair and the sunflower on the glove and you're like, oh man, that's not going to play on the South side. I think it will. Like, I think he will, he can also, he's also like a really like dirt bag grinder type guy. And he's a worker, man. Like, yeah. He's not that all Southsiders are dirtbags. That's not what I meant. But he's got that that work that workman like mentality that you want. And I know the guy worked his tail off to get back from two Tommy Johns. So um, the work ethics there. You know, does the stuff still play? We'll see. We'll see. I hope it does for your sake. Yeah, and uh, to speak to that, the last time I think we got a guy from San Diego, he was a dirtbag. He literally called himself a dirtbag and Jake Peavy. So the White yeah. Sox fans embraced Jake Peavy when he was here. So, yeah, I think Clevenger, his personality will play. But the White Sox fans in Chicago in general have that bad taste in their mouth. And so I'm glad you came on to clear it up a little bit that he's actually a good guy and he had one momentary uh, moment of weakness up there. In yeah, Chicago. you know, and his his – his record was 500 ish, but, um, you know, like I said, man, there were some spurts of, of brilliance from him. Uh, the old Clev coming back, um, you know, again, the, the herky jerky, the wind up, all that stuff, man, it's, it's his timing. Uh, it's so fun when it's working and when it's not working, you're going to see people tweeting about how annoying it is and just pitch the ball. Um, uh, but you know, look, baseball fans, all of us are fickle and, and as bad as, you know, it, 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 like the White Sox are all have been that team for the last few years. There was this collision course of what the Padres were doing and the White Sox. And it was like, man, these two teams are going to meet in the World Series. They are. It's coming. It's inevitable. Like it's going to happen. And I still think it could happen. But I know you guys are kind of fed up with mediocrity like we are here in San Diego. We're fed up with it. Like we don't we don't we can't do any more mediocrity. And uh, and I know that. I'm not saying Clev was a big part of that mediocrity because he wasn't at all, but I, I know that we're all in kind of different um, different points of our fandom. Like, we want a World Series. You guys have a World Series. We don't have a World Series. We want a ring and, and a, a flag, and I think a lot of people will die happy in San Diego. Herb, you know it well. Um, all we need is one. You know, all we're looking for is one. But to, to be like the White Sox and have all these expectations and to fall short – you know, God, we can relate. We can absolutely relate to that here. So there's a lot of lot of brotherhood going on between these two teams. 
Hey, all we want is a three hundred million dollar third baseman. We couldn't get that. Oh. You guys stole that from from us. <laughs> you you, you should have. You could have and should have had him. And I'm. I, it's the man is drastically underpaid uh, for what he's done for this franchise. So absolutely. Uh, final thing. Uh, yeah, we just wanted to bring up the vit- victory fish here uh, that Bo yes. uh, drew for him. Uh, so very yeah. cool here. But what was it like uh, having playoff yeah. baseball back in San Diego and Clevenger, like you said, embraced the city? So it must have been something he embraced as well. I can't even describe to you guys the amount of fun that we had on the show. And, you know, it's like anything. It's a, a job is a job, and it's like, oh, man, oh, okay. But then you sit back and pinch yourself, and you're like, all right, we had a four-hour show. Then we have a, a you know, uh, we're going to do a little pregame. Then we're going to go down to this playoff game where we're playing the Dodgers or whatever, and I, you have to pinch yourself. You know, then you win. You get to come in and talk about it in the morning. The whole city was just on fire. Like it was so cool, and I, I had to—I must have pinched myself a thousand times. Especially, you know, you go on to take the Mets, and you're like, "Hey, I'm just glad we're in the playoffs." You know, Scherzer, and you know, I'm just—I'm happy to be here. And then you punch Scherzer in the mouth at Game One, and you're like, "Oh, we're actually—we have a chance." And then you win, and you're like, "All right, well, the Dodgers. I mean, 111 wins. No, it's fun to beat them. It'd be great if we did." Then you beat them, and you beat them handily, and it's like, oh, my God. And God's truth, once we beat the Dodgers, I was like, I'm good. It's all gravy <laughs> from here. I mean, I really was. It was it was so special. And to take them down, you know, the best regular season they've ever had was oh, – it was magical. It was magical. Hang the banner for that one. I mean, truly. 100%. Uh, 100%. It's, now, it's as close to a World Series as you guys got it's, right it's, now. It's exactly right. It's yeah. the – it was literally half of our world series. I mean, we were like, you know what? This isn't the worst thing that ever happened. So <laughs> last thing I got for you, does Peter Seidler have any brothers or sisters? Yeah. Right. The, Seriously. That can own the white Sox and throw all the money at this franchise. Because like you said, I see these teams as similar, but with an owner and a GM that's ready to do things and an owner and GM with the white Sox are like, eh, we're fine. Yeah. That, and that bugs me, you know, that bugs me about, about, your owner and GM because there's so much young talent to build around. Like, like so many teams in baseball would kill for the core, you know, and I, I, I wanted to get your guys thoughts cause I'll take it and steal it for tomorrow. Like Astros got a really good player today, didn't they? Yes, they did. Yeah. Well, I mean, since 2014, he's had the most played appearances. And the thing that we kind of ended up talking about was it's very similar how Frank Thomas and Jose Abreu left this town Frank obviously left with a World Series. Jose hasn't. That's the biggest thing for his career. I think that he is such a team player, and it's going to be such a bigger moment for him when he wins a World Series than even when he won the the MVP just because he is such a team guy. So what the Astros got are exactly what the Astros need. More playoff experience, more just reliable guys. Their first baseman uh, or that first base position just got – you know, much what, better. I mean, yeah, incrementally better. I mean, it's an insane signing. It's just a smart signing by a smart baseball organization. We, we, we all wanted him badly. I mean, we've been talking about it on the air. What a perfect fit. He's going to fit right in, you know, with, with the guys that we have here with Tatis and Soto and Manny. Like, that's what you call a no brainer. Uh, I saw the numbers of what he's going to get paid and I went, yeah, that's a lot of dough. But, man, if the guy's, you know, hitting 30 bombs and hitting, uh, you know, all the doubles and the slug that we so desperately need, because we got guys that can get on base. We didn't have anybody that could drive them in. And so that's what we were desperate for. And, of course, the the, the good got a lot better uh, with the Astros getting him. So it's, it's a bummer, man, when you lose a guy like that. Yeah, the thing is with – Jose Abreu playing games in Chicago. He usually has slow starts April and May, very cold here. Sure. Now cold. he's in a dome in Houston with the Crawford boxes in the short right field. Jose Abreu is going to hit 30 plus home runs easily yeah. with the Houston Astros. And I don't, and I usually people say if healthy. Jose Abreu is healthy. He he's never healthy. takes yeah, out. Right. He's, he's always post. healthy. Yeah, yeah so, so that's it's Manny. a bad that's day like in Manny Chicago. Too. Yeah. The, the last, sucks, man. The last three year uh, contract he signed was uh, after what, the 2019 season? 
After the 2019 season. After 19. the 2019 season, and he responded by winning an MVP. So I can't imagine what the next three-year contract's going to do for him. I hope I hope it ends oh. in a World Series just because I feel like our team is going to win one, and uh, I'd rather yeah. have him win. So uh, that's Stephen Woods. You can follow him on Twitter, at the Stephen Woods. He's the host of Ben and Woods on 97.3 FM, the fan out in San Diego, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Appreciate you joining us here Thank today, you guys. Stephen. We appreciate it, and good luck to your San Diego squad uh, this offseason. Appreciate season. it. Good luck to the Sox. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Appreciate it. And See again, make sure bye you bye. follow him on Twitter at the Stephen Woods. Nice book. I love him. I love, love, love some San Diego. Oh, man. Californians. They're nice. I mean, always good to get a radio guy on because they know how to talk, especially that team. Ben is a TV guy who uh, converted to radio. Awesome. Paul Rindle, the executive producer. It's a great time to be in San Diego. And if you have quality people like that telling you the right stuff and the correct stuff, it's hard to go wrong with them. I mean, when is when is it not the right time to be in San Diego? 75 and sunny every day? Right. I mean, only an idiot would leave San Diego to come back to Chicago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> come on. And and only, you know, wear Illinois, Illini hat, shirt, be yeah. a Sox fan. Yeah. You know? Um, Bad choice has been made Carne asada fries, Cardiff crack. Oh, I've, I've heard all about the burritos. California so, I mean, burritos, delicious. Oh, my gosh. Mm. Lawrence, do we have that, that graphic I've, I forced no. you to make? Okay, that's fine. No. Um, I mean, I'll do it. Now, if you'd no, like. That's fine. I'm going to do an ad read, so I was just okay. wondering if it Let's was ready. On that. So I'll, I'll tell people about ComEd if, if that's cool. The Energy Efficiency Program from ComEd is committed to helping families and businesses in the communities we serve manage energy usage and lower energy bills now and into the future. ComEd offers a wide array of incentives on lighting and other efficiency upgrades to commercial, industrial, and public se sector customers of all sizes and uh, across our territory. Customers can inquire about how to update lighting to energy and money saving efficiency efficient led lights learn more about network lighting to operate your lights through your mobile device and track your facility's energy usage and more incentives have recently increased for indoor outdoor lighting and network lighting controls making these projects even more cost effective than ever before so visit comed.com slash powering biz that's powering b-i-z now to start saving money and energy and to start a project contact us at one 855 Four three three two seven zero zero, and for more information, email business ee at comed dot com or public sector ee at comed dot com. And our next partner is Foco. They are your stop for the best sports gear in town. You've already got the best coverage for your favorite teams, so get fitted in the best sports gear around. Foco has you covered from Soldier Field to the living room, north or south side, with hoodies, slippers, signs, bobbleheads, and everything in between. Get decked out like Demar with apparel from the leaders in sports merch and collectibles. Foco, that's F O C O. If you're looking for the perfect gift for the football fan in your life, Foco's got you covered with the with hoodies to fight that Lake Michigan breeze. So check out Foco.com again, F O C O, or click the link in the description below and for all non-presale items use promo code chgo for 10 percent off again foco.com that's foco and for all non-presale items use promo code chgo for 10 percent off and speaking of deals we have 50 percent off right now at the chgo locker diehards get an extra 20 percent off as well so we got shirts we got the size c shirt that uh, herb was wearing we got a couple of the script shirts in red and black i think those are some of the sleekest designs we have uh, herb's lifting up a shirt right now for the chgo bears shirt as well we have hoodies there so right now is the perfect opportunity and your last chance as well that deal is about to be over go to all go to all chgo.com click the chgo locker there or just go to chgo locker.com and check out the crazy cyber monday deals we have um i got one final thing on clevenger and then we'll get back to abreu i think it's really good to hear that stuff about his maturity yeah it doesn't seem like I, I sh we should be too worried about Clevenger. Um, he had that one mistake in Chicago, and it seems to be that one mistake. Yeah, and Steven's a straight shooter. Um, one of the things I like about him is he used to be a music DJ, you know, those guys sitting up music that they didn't like and just gritting, and, uh, gritting their teeth through it. He didn't do that. He was like, oh, here's a terrible album by Fleetwood <laughs> Mac. See, I put the Fleetwood Mac in there. Yeah, here's, a, here's a terrible a song by Fleetwood Mac. And play it because he had to play it. He would tell you truth, and he just told you the truth about Clevenger. He's not afraid of telling you exactly what needs to be heard by you. And so if he says that Clevenger's matured, he says that Clevenger is back on track. And we saw some of the velocity kind of return at the end of the season where he, I think, started 22 games. And so at the end of the year, he started to ramp up a little bit more from his second Tommy John surgery. And hopefully that means that he's hitting the ground running next year in 2023 with the White Sox as the fourth or fifth starter. 
Herb, I think I found it. What'd you find? I think I found the reason why the White Sox like Mike Clevenger. Okay. I think I found the reason why Mike Clevenger has had two Tommy John surgeries as well. And I think this is the reason why the White Sox are paying, apparently, $12 million for Clev. Uh, let's go to the first three pictures, Lawrence. Thank you very much. This is Dylan Cease, Lucas Giolito, and Ronaldo Lopez before Ethan Katz worked with them. Front foot down, and you could see that the arm is late. The one from Cease is from 2020. Oh, the one from Lucas Giolito is from 2018. And the one from Raylo is 2020. Lucas is clearly really, really bad and really, really late. You could still see that he is still well behind his head. Um, but even with Cease and Reynaldo, their arms, and, and Cease or, and Katz recently fixed this, um, are moving a little bit more forward once that front foot's down. Now let's look at Clevenger. This is from his time in Cleveland and his time in, in San Diego. Front foot down. Arm is still late. So that's the one huge thing that I think that Mike Clevenger needs to fix is that arm uh, uh, that arm swing. Yeah. Because when he's in a full windup, it goes out of his glove, down to his side, up to his elbow, out and over. He needs to make it more direct. He needs to make it quicker. And hopefully that will improve his fastball, improve his slider, and it could hopefully – make him or force him use his lower half more rather than his upper half because the issue with that is once that front foot's down, you really can't create that much torque anymore because your, your, your hips it's are already lot. facing. Yeah. So all you're doing is basically forcing your top half to just come and follow through and you're just, it's just, uh, the, the torque ends up hurting you. Yeah. Um, so it's just something that I think is fixable for, for Mike Clevenger. I think it's something that can work for Ethan Katz. It's a signing I'm excited about. And they you just have to deal with Jose Abreu leaving town. And they probably <laughs> see that, like, Lucas, when he was, he shortened up that long arm swing, he was hiding the ball more, like, behind his net, his head. And we already discussed yesterday that Clevenger is in the 88th percentile in extension. He's 6'4", and he gets a lot of extension. And that right. ball, if the ball you cannot see until he releases it at wherever release he has, which he has in the top, uh, one of the top releases in the game. It's going to get on you quicker, even if it is 93 at the time or 94. You know, you used to reach 99. It was really hard to hit back then because of all the moving parts and such. But, yeah, like you said, tighten up that arm swing, get a little bit more tight, and, yeah, use your legs a little bit more. You see Carlos Rodon with the thighs. Mm -hmm. You see uh, Lucas Giolito and them with the thighs. That's what your driving force. Your arm is just the, the thing that's moving the ball. And, you know, you need arm swing. You need fast arms. But. The lower half, that middle part, is where you're getting your right. your power from. And if you're using all that arm, that's why you get two uh, Tommy John surgeries. And like you said, Dave, he's locked out his hips, and he can't do the the app, the proper swing and use and have the proper uh, torque with his hips and his legs to get the ball moving where he needs to be moving. And so with that arm and that elbow just explodes a couple times. It's, it's just like Yasmani Grandal. I mean, the, the thing that he went down to AAA and fixed with Chris Johnson was his – Legs were too late. His his timing was off. And the issue that he was having was that his feet would be down, his feet would be planted, and that he would have to generate so much torque from his his, his upper half, and he wasn't able to fully use his body, uh, his lower half. Pitchers in the same way, you know, obviously it's a different motion, different, different activity, but still, you're using your full body. You're using that upper half, and I think that he can get a little bit more uh, from his lower half here. So hopefully uh, that can happen. And uh, shout out to AJ and Grinder saying Clevenger's cheeked up. It's true. I would say also Raylo and Cease looking cheeked up in those photos as well. I mean, Clevenger, I, I think it shows the extension there, and I think it shows the uh, the the athleticism, just the ability to how far down he's on the your mile, legs on the mound. Yeah, it's how, it's incredible. He's almost at the at the end of the mound there. A lot, lot of extension there for like a six one guy. No, if you he, he's six four. I, I is he six four? Yeah, six four. He's a little longer than yeah. He's and that hair is long too. That would be distracting four, wow. too. I wonder if Jerry and them like, hey, man, cut that hair down. <laughs> Probably. Who was the last player with long hair on the Sox? I don't know. I remember Kopech. Eight... Kopech has long hair. Yeah, but, with he him. but he puts it, puts it in a ponytail. He not all the time, it. though. He doesn't put it up. He does not like... Kopech's look. debut, he had long hair Kimbrel. out of his uh, his hair. Huh? I'm, sure, I'm sure he told him to cut that down. Kimbrel, too. Did he, have long, did he put it in a ponytail, too? No. No. I mean, no. here, this was Kopech on his debut. Yeah, and now you see that he's... It's somewhat not, shorter, not but... Not like that anymore. Yeah, but he's got a Fu Manchu. I mean, this was, you know, dirty, greasy, and it's touching the back of his 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 jersey. It's I'm a, not against it. I'm not against it either. This is a dumb rules. They tried to have... But it's not their rule. 
Oh, they tried to have Manny Ramirez cut his hair. That's one guy since 2009. And he like, have no. they done that since, though? Joe Creedy, AJ Prezinski, both had to cut their hair after 2016 okay. or 2006. They came. No, but I'm saying, have they done it since Manny in 2009? I don't know. That's, that's my thing. I don't know if they're going to do that again. Jerry so. Reinsdorf is a, is a Yankees, like he wants to be the Yankees type of guy. Mm-hmm. That's why the stadium looks like it looks like or used to look like. And he tried to do the institute, not the mustache thing, but he's like, hey, you got to look good. You can clean shaven. I remember AJ and Joe Creedy came in 2006 back and they were looking with some long hair and they had to cut that shit off. <laughs> Uh, that's Jerry for you. And, uh, Jerry uh, our, just doesn't spend the money like the Yankees. He's our beloved owner. owner. I was looking that. Yeah, the shark there, um, too, as Dan from the two one nine says. What was that? The shark, Jeff Samarja. Oh, so yeah, that's funny. I was I was looking up some Samarja stuff. Uh, shout out Jeff Samarja, Region Rat, um, White Sox legend. Yes. What is that? Twenty fifteen. I forgot. Right, 2015, 2014. Uh, three years later, just because we're putting together the uh, the top five Abreu moments, who is the pitcher? That Jose Abreu hit his first two hits off uh, the day he hit his cycle in 2017. It had to be the Giants, and it had to be Jeff Samarja. Jeff Samarja. He hit his home run in double off Jeff Samarja. So, I don't know. Just just, just shout out to Jose. Let's get back to him. Uh, first base, going to be Andrew Vaughn. Yeah. DH is going to be Aloy Jimenez. Yep. I think the question that you continue to ask me is, how do the White Sox make up for Jose Abreu's production? Why can't Andrew Vaughn replace Jose Abreu because he has to replace himself in the interim he's him still himself he's not coming from a different team Andrew Vaughn's still on this team so he has to do his own production and then Jose Abreu's production or at least do his home production and then do a portion of that and Aloy Jimenez pick up the other portion of that and still be Aloy Jimenez which is hard to do because you're never on the field so is it is it possible yes is it going to be easy? No. Andrew Vaughn has shown you nothing of what Jose Abreu is. I know he's the future, and I know that people love Andrew Vaughn. I'm an Andrew Vaughn fan, too. But I don't see – I never saw why there wouldn't be uh, Andrew Vaughn, Jose Abreu, Eloy Jimenez on the team. I know it's not ideal. I know it wasn't ideal, but it's much better than they are now. I think the team was better with those three – playing positions and sometimes Andrew Vaughn out of position than they are currently because they now don't have a left fielder and they don't have a right fielder well, that you would say, oh, yeah, let's throw that out there for a major league or a second baseman. Well, and then instead of maybe that question, like with uh, Vaughn playing first base and then Aloy playing DH and no left field, do the White Sox need to then make a splash? Do the White Sox need to spend the yeah. most money yeah. on – left field now that Jose Abreu is not there like do they have to spend no matter what more than 12 million dollars on a left fielder to assure that production from that position yes like if you're like the re- the only reason I can say that hey Rick I agree with you there if he comes on the press conference and says this we didn't think Jose Abreu can produce the stats that he did before we are paying for what he's gonna do not for what he did. I would say, Rick, go ahead, man. But that also signals that you have to go and sign somebody else that did what Jose Abreu does, offensively at least. And if they're not going to do that, then where are they going to get this production from? Oscar Colas, a man coming up for his first Major League Baseball experience is supposed to be all that? You going to put that pressure on him? We're already putting the pressure on Andrew Vaughn immediately when Andrew Vaughn struggles. Strikes out, makes an error at first base. Me and others, I'm like, oh, man, he, Jose Abreu would have did this. Or if Andrew Vaughn goes to the I.L., Jose Abreu wouldn't be on the I.L. That pressure is on Andrew Vaughn, warranted or not. He'll gonna, he's going to feel that. And now you're going to do that to Oscar Colas in his first major league season. No, go and get a person. Go and get a real person. Like, Mike Conforto is not even a top free agent. But that would be perfect. I see, uh, Was that, Wolf Larson has that as a suggestion. I'm in. You have to go and spend some money. Otherwise, if you're going to just let Jose Abreu go without any 
Everybody coming back for Jose Abreu. Yeah, we don't have uh, a Mailbag Monday today. We got a ton of questions from our people in the Discord, and shout out to all of our diehards in that Discord uh, for, for giving these questions. But the Jose Abreu thing uh, made us, you know, change the plan a little bit. But we'll have a Mailbag Tuesday for you. But one of those questions was at Crazy Gas Bag saying, now we have about $15 million-ish for a right fielder and second baseman. I don't think second base is that important. Would you spend, if... The remaining budget is $15 million. All of that on Michael Conforto. Yes. So you're fine with the two acquisitions this offseason being Clevenger and Conforto. They've put themselves in that situation, and if they say that this is their budget, then yes. But I don't think it's their budget. I think they can spend much more. If they get a player like Michael Conforto, and Michael Conforto goes back to 2019 Michael Conforto, yeah, I'm in. I don't think that... Um, Andrew Vaughn and Sh- I think uh, Chef Fidel put that he's going to hit 30 home runs. Why is Andrew Vaughn going to hit 30 home runs? What's changing? Because he's not playing the outfield? Is that it's going to turn him into a good hitter? I mean, he hit 17 last year in pretty much a full season. What's going to give you these 13 more home runs? Well, hopefully, I think his legs are going to be that much fresher. You you would hope playing. that his legs and back would be that much fresher because again, what's going to be the excuse in 2023 offseason when we're having this show well, again? So I, I I'm I don't know I'm kind of I'm kind of sick of that talk because if Andrew Vaughn goes out and doesn't produce, then yeah he fucking sucks and yeah he he it was I'm the wrong move. Sucks. I know, but like do I'm you know what? Like, yeah yeah if he goes out in 2022 and he has a bad year, you know what? He had a bad year, but I think through the first two years, I think there's enough there to give him those excuses because he was playing out of position. He was a first baseman in college, drafted to be a hitter, and they put him in left field. Yep. That was a fucking mistake. It's it's not even who's, an excuse. It's a fucking mistake. Whose mistake was it? Rick Hahn, but it's not Andrew Vaughn's fault. But Andrew Vaughn isn't a different player because he's in left field. He's a bad left fielder because he's not a left fielder. He's a good first baseman. And if he goes out and doesn't perform at first base, then fine. It was the wrong move. They should have. They shouldn't have let Jose Abreu walk. And Rick Hahn's a moron. No, no, but, the ho- results don't prove the decision correct. Is it a wrong move now, or is it a wrong move at? Is it not a wrong move? It's right the now? right move. Okay, it's the right move. Period. Right. And if Andrew Vaughn, if Andrew Vaughn goes out and plays 150 games and hits 10 home runs and stinks, I'll wear it. No, no, that I'll wear it. Like I'll I wear said, it. I'll wear it. I'm, I'm saying that won't happen. The period. results of this thing, I will not judge it off of the results. I'm saying it's a mistake currently now, and it will be a mistake going to the future. No matter if Jose Abreu. Does Jose Abreu things, which I think he will, or Andrew Vaughn becomes the guy that everybody wants. The eggs are in Andrew Vaughn's basket. They put them all there, every single one, and that's a lot of pressure to put on him. So get him some help. Get him a Conforto. Yes, having Aloy Jimenez at DH would be awesome, but he got hurt running the bases. I just want this organization to do right by the fans and by the, right, by the team. So I think it's a mistake today. And I'll think it's a mistake tomorrow. I'll think it's a mistake next year if Andrew Vaughn, even if Andrew Vaughn hits 30 home runs, because you could have still had that on the team and you could have had Jose Abreu. You could have. I don't know how it would have worked, but I mean, you, you could have had those both on the team. And hey, shout out to Io. Look at Io hanging out with us today uh, on he's, the bottom of the screen. Saw, saw I was wearing my Illini gear. He's like, let me join. Yeah, you know, trying to, trying to get sell in. some merch. You know, it's, do you remember uh, when. Um, up 50% off of around the Do you remember long CSU ago? Locker. When that Illini team, that Illini, that uh, Illini great Ayo uh, DeSumo was wearing right there with the Southside Bias shirt, beat the brakes off of Northwestern. They're beating them 34 to nothing, and that crappy coach up there in Northwestern kicked the field goal down 34 in the fourth quarter. <laughs> yeah, we talked he about you that. you on Twitter, right? Yeah, because he's, he's, he's terrible. They went 1-11. and 11. He's, he's not sweating his job. Last year, we went 3-9. and nine. So he's been... Horrible the last two years. I know this is not uh, CHGO Northwestern or CHGO Illinois, which we should get. I'm kidding. But that guy sucks. Fitz sucks. How he's, many? He's a terrible coach. I, I don't watch a ton of uh, big well, Ten. Northwestern, they get standards. They get getting people in school. Well, that's their fault. <laughs> I don't watch a lot of Big Ten football. Oh, uh, we smoked it how many, out of those people. I how, was live there. It was great. How many How many games did uh, Northwestern win this year on American so- Zero. soil? Zero. Oh, wow. Zero. Zero. The only team they That's beat crazy. is the team that fired the coach halfway through the season and Scott Frost. They beat Nebraska by coming back in Ireland. Otherwise, they got beat by every single other team. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, in we, America, our, our guy Stephen Gottright uh, does have a question, uh, and I think we'll we'll wrap it up on here, and we'll figure out uh, what we're going to do tomorrow. We do have a mailbag Tuesday for you, but I think we'll probably spend a, a lot of time talking about uh, a couple of guys here, like uh, Aloy Jimenez and Andrew Vaughn, how they can step up for the Sox in 2023. But uh, Stephen asking, how is Vaughn defensively as a first baseman? I think that's my biggest problem here is just uh, the amount of attempts he's had at first base. Very, uh, 71. That's it. He's wow. only played 71 attempts uh, at first base over the past two years. So I don't think there's a big enough sample size to know if he's good or bad. Um, his outs above average are a minus three, but how comfortable is he? Um, what's it like switching those positions? For a full season, I'd be shocked if he's below average because just in the outfield, it seemed like he was smart, seemed like he understood the parameters of a baseball field, understood where balls were going to go, could judge them off the bat correctly. I, I didn't see any huge errors when he was playing at first over the past two couple of years. So the defense, I think, probably won't drop off from him and Abreu just because Abreu was probably about average as I well. I think it will drop off slightly because Jose Abreu is like 6'3", and he has long levers. That's fair. Andrew Vaughn's like my height, 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, <laughs> I'm not 5'8". I'm a little taller than that. But he's shorter, and he's got he sawed off. Got those shorter arms, it's like so he won't be able to pick it as well as other people will, and he won't be able to jump as high because he can jump as high as I do. We should do that too. As I challenged uh, Yasmani, I'll challenge uh, Andrew Vaughn to a jump, a contest. vertical jump. Yeah, I think I get a credit card under mine. Can you, Andrew? Can you? I mean, you could probably fit like a, a a decent phone book, not a big phone book. Okay, I think Andrew Vaughn can fit a phone book. I mean, he did do a home run, I think, one time. No, I thought he did. I would probably have pinned that to my. Twitter profile, if, if sure Andrew Vaughn robbed a home run. It was at the wall. I'm sure he did. Andrew Vaughn, are you sure it's not A.J. Pollock? No, I think Andrew Vaughn did something where it's like it, at the wall and he caught it. In left field? Either left or right field, but. Oh, here we go. Yeah, leaping grab. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah in 2022 against the Tigers. You're right. Yeah. Uh, off Javi Baez, uh, Gilio on the bump, throws it right down the middle because, of course, it was a fastball right down the middle. <laughs> and uh, Andrew Vaughn, I mean, look at this. Look at this leap. I mean, it, it's kind of like more of a gallop. He kind of pushes off rather than jumping up. And he's Hobby, not an course, explosive he he's a... leaper, but oh, he's yeah. a he's a galloper, oh. I would say. Um, it, it's kind of like he was hurdling. Um, we do have a super chat from Kirk, and we'll wrap it up here. Uh, what do you guys think of the ripple effect of Jose leaving? Will be in the the club, Aloy, Robert, et cetera. Saw him as a dad. Uh, now a chip on their shoulder. No, this is a great question. Um, yeah, as Monty Grandal said, when he first arrived in Chicago on 6-7 the score after he signed his massive contract, we are here to win a championship for Jose Abreu. They failed. I don't know how they're going to respond. This is a huge message, I think, to the clubhouse. We heard throughout this season that the White Sox don't have veteran leaders. Their true veteran leader, the guy that they said led by example, was their dad, was their master splinter, is gone. Yasmani Grandal is going to need to step up. Lance Lynn's going to need to step up. Liam Hendricks is going to need to continue to step up. But those guys... Aloy and Robert need to be the producer. They don't need to be the leader, but they need to step up and they need to post just like Jose Abreu did. If they want to be anything like he was, if Luis Robert and, and Aloy Jimenez want to have those historic careers uh, like 79 did, if 74 and 88 want to be retired too, they have to pr- start producing this season. Same thing with Yohan Moncada. Like, Jose Abreu not being there shouldn't cause them any type of discomfort. It's sad that your guy that you've seen every day is not going to be there, but you know it's the business of baseball. Move, Step up. Forget about it. You'll see him on the first game. When they're raising the banner, White Sox will be there opening night. You can say what's up to Jose. Hey, Jose, good to see you, brother. We're going to go out and win this game. We got a four-game set for you guys. We're taking you down type of thing. I hope they have a chip on their shoulder. It's like Jose is going to the greener pastures. Jose is Kevin Durant. Now we're going to be left here with this regular ass team. We're the Oklahoma City Thunder. We got to go and take it to these people. He's joining the he's joining the bad team. And now we hate Jose Abreu type of thing. Have that mentality like we got to step up. Our leaders not here. Now we are leaders. And uh here's the other thing too that I just realized because uh you mentioned going across and see him at the Diamond. First game for the White Sox in 2023. Sox versus Astros. Yeah. In Houston. Yeah, her so, yeah. Okay. Uh just that's you were looking the, it up while he was saying I it. I was looking loud. it up while he was saying it. My bad, Herb. No um he, it comes back on May twelfth through the fourteenth. May twelfth through the fourteenth. So uh you'll be able to cheer on Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday. You'll cheer on uh, Jose Bray when he comes back. And uh Duke's cheering you on in the comments saying Thank let's you, go Duke. because you're making great points. Uh it's such a great point, I had to make it twice. But the 
thing is, somebody pointed this out on Twitter. It's like, now batting Jose Altuve. <laughs> now batting Jose Abreu. Yeah. That place is going to go nuts. Like, we're going to be cheering for an Astro. Like, yeah, it's going to be like a, a nice two, three that is, minute. Yeah, that's like 5,000 fans. Probably. Nice two. Th- <laughs> oh, man. In May, we're going to be competing still. So we're good. But, yeah, it's going to be a good day to celebrate Jose Abreu. We'll have a nice video, not the Matt Thornton video, an actual video of a champion player that is going to have his number retired. It's just a sad day in White Sox history that our best player is leaving us for the enemy. It's very sad. It is sad. And, uh, I hope we can get two of those four games. Imagine if the White Sox, of all years in 2023, sweep the Astros. All six games. Just imagine. We'll play seven next year. Is it seven? Yeah, with four at the start. Four is opening. And then three in, the May, in May. Well, oh. imagine if we won seven games against the Astros. Then we'll lose three in the playoffs. And then they, and the then they lose every other, <laughs> you know, 150-something games. Anyways, that's going to do it for the CHGO White Sox podcast. That's Herb Lawrence. Hey. Follow him on Twitter at ActionRall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. I think AJ's saying it's early. It's early in the season, guys. We haven't even played a game yet. So, Jose Abreu not being on the team, why are you worried? They haven't even lost a game yet, you know? So, They're losing that first one. You don't even know what to expect in 2023. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be betting on Jose Abreu to hit a home run. Probably two uh, in that game. <laughs> I, I imagine a Jose Abreu revenge game. Here's the first pitch. Dylan sees, pit, sees crack. <laughs> Here's the second pitch. Crack. Here's a third pitch, tries a slider, crack. Here's a fourth pitch, double. Uh, have your worst game on the on opening night and then deal after that cease. We're already we're already dreading 2023. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna start the year with a, a nine run uh, opening day start against Houston and then go on a twenty six straight uh, outing where he's given up one earned run or less. That works. Anyways, uh, Turd Ferguson's going to restart the podcast. We're going to end it. Again, that's Herb Lawrence. I'm Sean Anderson. Thank you to Lawrence Benedetto for producing the show today, The Law Dog. Hi. We appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to everyone for hanging out with us. And Stephen Woods uh, from 93.7 FM, the fan out in San Diego, for giving us some insight into Mike Clevenger and the man that he was in San Diego. He's your new pitcher for the White Sox. We'll talk to you tomorrow at 4 p.m. here on the CHGO Sports YouTube channel. Make sure you like this video and subscribe so you don't miss when we go live. We also have Bears After Dark tonight starting at 6.30. Correct. Bulls and Blackhawks? Uh, Bulls are playing tonight. Bulls got Bulls playing tonight. So you you also got Bulls coming uh, pregame and postgame with Matt, Dave, and Will. Uh, Bulls are playing tonight at 8 p.m. against Utah. It's the Larry Markinen revenge game. Let's oh, go. I'm not ready for that. Let's go. Oh, All right, God. we'll make sure yeah, you join. 7.30 Bulls pre. Matt Peck will probably <laughs> already be angry. <laughs> make sure you join an angry Matt Peck then, along with Big Dave and uh, Will, and uh, also Bears After Dark uh, starting at 6.30. Thank you very much for joining us. We will talk to you tomorrow. Go Sox.